Welcome to a series I was going to call Cars of My Own that I'd forgotten to do a proper review on, but it's now actually called Cars I Reviewed that happened to belong to me the day before the country went on lockdown because it was all I could get my hands on in a hurry. And today I'm driving my Rover 220 Coupe or Tomcat for probably the last time in a while. I will apologise and say if this feels like it's a bit rushed or there's a lot of voiceover or you notice the car isn't particularly clean. This is because at the moment we are on limited um, travel and everything and there are rumours that we may get the lockdown like Italy and Spain have had any day now. So I want to get this car shot as fast as possible and a couple of others as well. Which believe it or not is not an irresponsible act because I'm on my own in remote country lanes in car parks and inside a car so although I'm out and about I am alone and I'm isolating in a vehicle. The Rover 200 in both its original 1984 SD3 form and perhaps even more so the 1989 and onwards R8 form is steadily gaining, I say finally gaining, a long deserved reputation as something of an emerging classic and people are finally appreciating the genius of the design that it was, perhaps none more so than the coupe or as we now know it the tomcat like sd3 before it the r8 was a collaboration with honda this time based on the concerto both cars were built in the long bridge plant where things differ between honda and rover is that whereas honda had a very limited idea of how they wanted the concerto to progress into a range rover knew from the outset they wanted to get the absolute maximum from that platform in fact they had six body styles at the end three and five door hatchbacks the five door estate the three door gti the convertible and this the coupe. The family styling of the R8 series was done by Roy X and it's a lovely bit of styling and it carries over really well to this shape here the lower bodied coupe and although there are strong visual similarities none of the body panels are actually interchangeable apart from the bonnet and even that's slightly different thanks to the bulge. Now the way the car was styled was deliberately conservative it was never meant to be an exaggerated groundbreaking fashion friendly statement it was always meant to be just a good looking elegant piece of design and that long term has served very much in its favour because as the years have gone by it hasn't dated horribly it's actually kind of got better and better looking to the current day eyes until now it is you know, borderline or actual modern classic the one thing that could have been different though is this badge on the front obviously it says rover now we know it's a rover but at the outset the concept car for this was badged as an mg and this was planned to be an mg branded car However, they got wind of the new MX-5 coming from Japan and they realised that any MG sports car based on a family car just wouldn't cut it anymore. They had to have a bespoke one-off chassis, not a, not a re-engineered hatchback. Hence, this moved over to become a Rover and the MGF project, which would have been a sister car to this, went solo. And you can tell the difference between a Mark 1 and a Mark 2, well, facelift car, thanks to this grille. The original Mark 1s have a completely flat bonnet with a little kind of pointy bit just under in the centre to meet it and uh, the Mark II's obviously have the chrome grille. If you wanted to convert a Mark II back to a Mark I you could uh, just take this in and fill the holes and paint it and then find yourself the lower lower plastic finisher if you can find one. This car is technically slightly too old to have this facelift grille on it so we think that as it was a demonstrator it may well have been fitted by the dealership who were selling it to try and keep the, the car looking fresh and extend its life as a demo car a little bit longer. Here around the back there are lots more unique to the coupe parts. This spoiler is coupe only, this lower spoiler is coupe only. I have a feeling these bumpers are coupe only as well and I think the boot lid might be shared with the convertible but that's it. One thing it's not too hard to get hold of if you do break one are these lights which are shared with much of the rest of the 200 series and also if you find one in a breaker's yard an XJ220 will have them as well. Getting into the boot you can either twist your key in here and probably break it or you can use the latch down by your foot in the driver's seat which is a very Honda thing to be honest and inside you have a fairly reasonable sized boot, it's quite deep but the aperture entering it is quite small. The, um, the rear parcel shelf almost looks like it's been borrowed from the convertible because it sits so low into the back of the boot. Um, it really does intrude a long way. Fortunately the seats do fold down, it's a 50-50 split down the middle although the hole into the back of the car isn't particularly huge. Under the floor you've got a full size alloy wheel in the same style as the road wheels which is uh, almost unheard of these days. Now the other thing people always remember about these cars, apart from the turbo, is the roof, the glass T-top which pops open and oops, lifts out to give you a, whoops, I need two hands for this, a full open air experience. 
you can also take out the central bar for a complete open top feel. And with the big frameless windows open on the door, it's virtually a convertible kind of experience. The full on Targa. Now, although whenever anyone thinks of the Rover Tomcat, they automatically think turbo and the T-Series, well, maybe just turbo. But in fact, there were five engines throughout the production run. At launch, it had the 1.6 litre Honda, making 109 horsepower for the more economically minded driver, as well as the T-Series in both two litre non-turbo form and two litre turbo, making 136 and 197 horsepower respectively. So it's no wonder everyone remembers the turbo. When they facelifted the car in 1996, the engines changed. The 1.6 litre entry option became a Rover K-Series and both versions of the two litre were dropped in favour of the 1.8 VVC, which sat in between the power level of the non-turbo and the turbo at 148 horsepower. So a compromise. Some people say it delivers the power more smoothly, but it's never going to have the grunt and the headline appeal of the turbo, is it? The T-Series engine is incredibly reliable. There are virtually no serious issues with it, but it does tend to weep oil along the front, which this one has done in the past, I think is doing again. Now the 200 series, or R8, or 400 series as they all were together, was that always conceived to be a good looking high-end luxury car, certainly luxury in its class anyway. So the fixtures and fittings were really nice. You've got leather, half leather seats, you've got leather steering wheel on the upper models, you've got walnut trim on all of the cars. This has unfortunately flaked in the damp over the last winter, which is a shame. But yeah, they were well specced and well appointed. The coupes came with electric front windows, the rears are fixed. One touch opening on the driver's window, the door handles are a nice chrome cast metal thing rather than a plasticky thing. As I said, the uh, steering wheel on the upper cars were, were leather rimmed wheels, which is great. Um, this one originally as a two litre non-turbo came with a, a rubbery plastic wheel, which I changed later on for a nice leather one. And of course we have the fantastic Rover R8 slash Honda dials, which I always go on about because they are just the best dials I've ever seen. They're, they're really big, they're really clear, they do exactly what they say. This one goes to 150 because the turbo could actually do 150. In fact, I think they could go off the clock if you put them down a hill fast enough. It's a nice symmetrical design, heater on the left, fuel on the right, and a nice kind of banked array of warning lights around the e edges, which you don't normally see. And if it was automatic, down the centre you have a little kind of uh, indicator strip to tell you which gear you're in. Of the usual Rover R8 switch gear, on the left you have three buttons on a panel, all very square with little fingertip touches for your hazard warning lights, front and rear fogs, and over on the right, which is where you find the hood retraction button on the convertible, I've got a rear screen heater. One thing we can never miss out, of course, is the horn test. That's a great horn, isn't it? They did so many things so well on the Rover R8, and that is one of the many things they did so well. The other thing they did really well on this car is the T-shelf, an unsurpassed T-shelf. If you want to bring a mug, it's perfect. It's exactly the right size for two mugs here, biscuits here. It's rubbery, grippery, so even if you move off gently, the tea will stay put. And a nice big cubby for sandwiches down in the centre of the console. In fact, I think this T-shelf is so good, it deserves a T-shirt. I think I'll go home and work on a T-shelf t-shirt or possibly even a sticker. You guys like the sound of that? Let me know in the comments. Now the rest of the dials are completely standard to the rest of the R8 family. The nice big easy to use heater controls with that nice fresh air vent as well. Uh, Rover radio, this is the original Rover radio with CD changer controller option which would have been a six disc changer in the boot. I believe it's a Philips underneath the, uh, the Rover badging. 12 volt cigarette lights, a socket and a pull out ashtray and as I mentioned the big 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 cubby hole there. If it wants a place in a 90s car with room for a phone and the phone will also sit up here on the t-shelf as well and not fly off. As standard it came with a five-speed manual gearbox. It's of course a Rover gearbox and so they do occasionally have problems with the linkages being a bit on the floppy side which this car does have. There was an automatic option but that was a 1.6 only thing. It was designed as a sports car so there wasn't really room for an auto in that range. Nice mechanical handbrake, we love those and a big cubby hole with a cassette holder in it, which I've actually loosened off and removed because I'm going to turn that into a cup holder somehow. With a matching leathery top to go with the half leather seats. And this being the sports version, these bucket seats are incredibly supportive. It's very firm padding on the base and the back, and these bolsters are absolutely enormous. So you're not at all going to fall out of here. The sun visors are tiny. They do just about work though. The roof line on the car is lower than on the hatchback and estate versions, so I guess no, they, they worked it out, I'm sure. And of course, you have easy access to your pop-up roof from the, from the driver's seat. You can just reach over your head and pop it up, get some fresh air in. Let's have a quick look in the back and then take it for a drive. Getting in the back is very easy. There's a nice big handle on the side of the seat. The seat folds forward a nice long way, and then you can climb into what is basically 
two individual bucket seats and you are separated by the sort of half leather padding -y bit. It's an individual three point seat belt for each person. A, a huge kind of side bin for your bits and pieces down the side and the same nice fabric as on the seats here in the door cards. The windows, as I mentioned, don't open, they are fixed and the headlining, which we don't talk about too much in this particular car, is uh, quite low on your head. It would be less low if it wasn't bodged together by a fool. Um, and you do have handles and a coat hook. There's only one courtesy light which is here in the centre of the car so it illuminates both the front and the back. Both front seats have a big map pocket in there. You've not got bad leg room, it's a bit tight on your ankles and in the regular driving position I don't sit that far back and this is still quite heavily in my face so it's okay for a short journey but not for too long. the uh, rear camera angle gives some idea of how light and airy this car feels in the cabin because the glass roof, the pillarless windows, or frameless windows I should say, and this big big windscreen and also the huge glass in the back as well. It does feel so light, so airy, it's a lovely car to be in. I'm hoping there's not too much wind noise from these uh, T-tops which have opened because it's quite a warm day today surprisingly. In a standard car the ride is typically Rover R8, it's quite soft but with loads of grip and control. I've altered this one with gas coilovers which I've then subsequently messed up by adjusting the wrong way as you may have seen in a recent update in the workshop but regardless of that the car does have a great chassis, it's relatively stiff, certainly very stiff for the time of it was produced. And wonderful road holding, it really does give you loads of confidence to blast into corners and have a great time with the thing. And we slow down into a 20 mile an hour after the nice corner. If this car has one Achilles heel, it's the brakes. They're nowhere near up to the power that especially the turbo had. At the planning stages of this car, they'd intended to use the bigger discs and pads and bigger calipers from the 800 turbo, but there was a problem. Very quickly, uh, owners of the new 800 turbo were reporting badly warped and juddering brakes and they're bringing them back under warranty. And this was just as this car was about to go into production. They didn't have the time or the budget to do any kind of fix. They just had to use a smaller size brake that was in the parts bin. And so for that reason, it's always been under braked, doing 50 or 45 miles an hour right now. That's not bad, but that's because I've stuck EBC green stuff discs and pads all round, because before it was a little bit frightening. Now Rover's reputation for quality has been unfairly tarnished, it has to be said, because cars like this really are very well made indeed. This is pushing 30 years old and okay, the seats are starting to creak a bit and some of the interior cardboard fittings aren't that great anymore, but the car still drives beautifully and things like these amazing indicator stalks. Proper R8 parts bin fare are lovely, they're still nice firm clicks to them. And they feel great in your hand, there's no wobble and vibration when you try and change the indicator or the lights. All the switch gear and the dashboard feels nice as well. The only real thing that fails frequently is the uh, resistor, the blower resistor on the fan. And that you can change for about four pounds by reaching behind the dashboard and unplugging a different part. The most desirable of these cars are the fully loaded, even air conditioned batch of 1995 cars that weren't registered until 1998. They're now known as the FDHs because a batch was sent out to Japan, didn't comply with the change regulation and came back and were all given the number plate ending in FDH. If you find one of those, they are the holy grail of Rover Tomcat or Rover Coupe. Now this car is actually an awful lot of fun to drive. 
kind of loath to admit it because I always really wanted an Alpha 145 and that was kind of my benchmark for sports cars and hot hatches I really wanted to own. But this actually kind of feels a bit more fun than the Alpha in some ways. Maybe it's got to change the suspension and the exhaust on it, but maybe it's just a really good car. Let's go through a corner with some gusto. For the time, the performance was impressive. The 1.6K series would do 0-60 in 7.8 seconds and reach 131. The 2.0-litre non-turbo did 0-60 in 8.2 and 127, but the turbo would do 0-60 in 5.7 and reach 150. Uh, you guys won't be able to see this because it's in my rearview mirror and none of the cameras are pointing backwards right now. But there's an absolutely immaculate early Saab 9000 in metallic green just swung in behind me. Oh, that's a pretty car. I think everyone's taking their cool cars out for one last drive in case we get locked down tomorrow. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed coming out for a ride on what is a glorious day in what is actually a really good sports car that everyone seems to have forgotten is a really good car. Because it is. If you've enjoyed this, please hit like it, please hit subscribe. I have no idea what's coming next. There's always something different, but at the moment we live in interesting times. So who knows what I'll have got my hands on or if I'm even getting out and driving new cars or if this is an archive thing I shot a while ago coming next. But thanks for watching and I hope I'll see you again soon. And stay safe, everybody.